Today, our colleagues from UC San Diego will present about Triton GPT, a solution built on an advanced open source large language model that is capable of answering a wide variety of questions about UC San Diego and, and more, which we'll hear about. So we will have some time for questions at the end, of, in the middle and kind of the end of each um, segment of the presentation. So please put your questions in the Q&A and I'll make sure to um, surface those when the time is right. So today I would like to introduce Brett Polak, the Project and Change Lead, um, Director of Workplace Technology Services, Informa Information Technology Services at UC San Diego. Welcome, Brett, and take it away. Thank you very much, Kara. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here with some of my colleagues here to talk to you today about Triton GPT. Um, I am Brett Polak, Senior Director, Workplace Technology Services. Um, and as uh, many campuses are doing right now, trying to figure out how to harness and wrangle AI, uh, given all the, um, the uh, you know, the, the effort and focus in on this technology uh, in, in the community, in the technology community. Uh, the AI um, service line is underneath my purview. Uh, so I've been the, the lucky person uh, to uh, uh, kind of figure out what we're gonna do to wrangle it at UC San Diego, at least in the administrative space. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it off to um, Adam Tillman to introduce himself. Thanks, Brent. Uh, my name is Adam Tillman. Uh, I'm a principal architect and analyst with our academic technology services unit in information technology services. Uh, my work until recently has mostly been in the research and instructional space, um, helping uh, our faculty and students make use of machine learning and data science technologies uh, for their work. And it was a, uh, a natural collaboration for me to come on over to the other side of ITS and uh, work with Brett to get this project up and running. I'll go over to Jack Brzezinski, who's our uh, IT uh, uh, expert, uh, I'm sorry, AI expert, and uh, uh, that we have uh, brought into the campus. Jack, yes. take it away. Uh, yes, uh, hello, uh, Jack Brzezinski. Uh, I'm a senior uh, AI architect uh, on our uh, generative AI projects. I work with Brett and Adam and the rest of the team and trying to get uh, the Triton GPT architecture uh, kind of, uh, you know, move it forward and uh, enable new features. So, so yeah, that's kind of the, the area of focus for, for me here. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can do a screen share. So we got a few slides. Um, I'll do. I'll jump into a demo, and then I'll pass it off to Adam and Jack to kind of talk about some of the technical aspects of Triton GPT. Um, so you know, just in a little background, in terms of, and I know I've talked to a lot of UC colleagues about, you know, what they're doing in, in terms of, uh, you know, AI or generative AI on their campus, uh, and so it's been super interesting hearing all the different stories and I guess different attitudes maybe at both the senior leadership level and on the ground about, uh, you know, kind of the uh, opinions about uh, generative AI and pros and cons and, you know, things that either we maybe want to be cautious about in terms of unleashing or making available to folks, or just jumpstarting and getting our kind of hands dirty with this technology and getting it in front of people uh, so that they're starting to use it and figure out uh, how, they, how we might be able to harness it to make um, you know, folks uh, more efficient in their jobs. And so that really has kind of been the focus of us, um, you know, looking at uh, the release of uh, commercial uh, tools like uh, ChatGPT and uh, Google Bard, now Google Gemini, uh, Copilot from Microsoft, uh, as a lot of these technologies became available and our staff started using them, uh, they approached us and said, you know, what should or we should not be putting in these tools? Um, and at the time, uh, we really didn't have any contract in place with any of these providers. And so we were obviously very cautious in terms of our guidance. Uh, you know, we were saying, you know, limit any interactions you have to P1, P2 data um, at most and ensuring that, um, you know, we are looking at alternate solutions, both contractually with these organizations and these companies, in addition to kind of looking, you know, is there something that we could potentially do ourselves uh, in-house? Um, and so, you know, as we started engaging with, you know, the Microsofts and the open AIs, um, and as we started to do some calculations about what it would cost to make some of these things available to a broad audience in our community, uh, you know, looking at monthly fees, uh, you know, anywhere in the neighborhood of $20 to $30 per month, per user per month, 
uh, and you quickly do that calculation and you realize that there's not going to be a good opportunity to scale this uh, very far. Um, you know, I know there's been some universities that have kind of taken the approach in which you integrate in with uh, an API, API through OpenAI, for example, uh, through our Azure agreement that we have with Microsoft. Um, but even in that case, you still have to pay for tokens uh, and usage. And so as you're starting to promote maybe these solutions, uh, there's kind of an unknown when it comes to what this total cost would be, you know, over the long term. Uh, and so for us, um, you know, what we started looking at uh, and that Adam will get into a little bit is just we have a data science and machine learning platform that um, we're already using uh, and have been using for about six years now in our teaching and learning space. Um, so it has, you know, Jupyter Notebooks and a lot of the technologies needed, um, you know, for data science kind of work. And so knowing that, um, you know, we could potentially bolster this environment with additional GPUs and things of that nature, that we potentially could leverage something that we already had in place um, and build upon that. And then look at that as kind of the foundation and basis for uh, leveraging you know, some of the open source models that uh, realistically were pretty close to being on par with where um, you know, at least OpenAI GPT 3.5 was. Um, and so I saw a question too about, you know, is the Llama, uh, mod, uh, Llama based? Uh, so yes, uh, we are running Llama 2 as our large language model in on the back end powering Triton GPT. Uh, we've also brought in and looked at Mixtral, uh, another open source model that uh, is uh, seems to be kind of on par with Llama 2 in terms of some of the benchmarks. Um, and so, you know, we know that, um, you know, with this uh, environment that we're in with these large language models, um, you know, shifting and, and, and coming out in, in such a rapid pace, um, that there's always going to be something better on the horizon, right? So, um, so kind of going back to you know what we've done in terms of our approach is that you know we we have the San Diego Supercomputer Center, uh, which we are obviously closely aligned with here at UC San Diego, uh, and so we have been using that as the basis for uh, a lot of these frameworks that we bought, uh, that we brought in. Um, we know that we're going to have to offer other generative AI services that are part of, say, Microsoft Copilot or uh, you know, Google Gemini, uh, Zoom has their AI companion. So we've been looking at these kind of case by case, knowing that Triton GPT is kind of this, um, you know, broadly uh, available, or at least that's our target is making it broadly available to employees on both the campus and health sciences side. Uh, but then knowing that we're also going to have to look at some of these commercial products uh, and that are kind of embedded with these vendors uh, to kind of do more purpose built deployment of these AI solutions. Um, that are obviously now part of you know most commercial software packages or at least on their roadmap. Um, from a timeline perspective, you know just to kind of give you a snapshot of uh, you know where things kind of started, um, we have an AI community of practice uh, that started at uh, IT services that we're a part of, um, and it basically was just a lot of people that were kind of experimenting with generative AI solutions, uh, kind of on nights and weekends. Uh, and so we uh, came up with some ideas for some things that we might be able to do. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, someone was dis discovered, uh, one of our student workers actually, uh, was an open source framework from a company called Dancer. Um, and so they actually are two UC San Diego alumni um, that came and presented at one of our AI communities of practice. Um, and so everyone got kind of excited about the technology, basically linking, you know, large language models into uh, you know, context-based um, use cases around harnessing the type of information that we have on, you know, hundreds of websites that are out there or, you know, Atlassian Confluence, you know, wikis and um, Google Drives and those kinds of things. And so we saw a real neat opportunity to be able to partner with this group uh, to kind of create the idea behind uh, Triton GPT, which really would be uh, merging that large language model uh, and we did select Llama 2 uh, for our initial use case. And then, um, you know, linking that into some of the, the context that we have on websites throughout UC San Diego. Uh, so we deployed a pilot back in October of 2023 uh, with uh, working closely with Chris and Yu Hong. Um, and on November, we gave a demo to our chancellor. Um, our chancellor really liked this idea and it was really into embracing uh, generative AI for the purposes of trying to make our administrative population more efficient. And so his edict was really just to get it in the hands of some uh, kind of handpicked 
people across the organization that was represented across different vice chancellor areas, get them using it, get some feedback, figure out if it's going to work uh, for a broader population, and then make that determination. Um, so he did give us some seed funding that allow us to uh, purchase some additional hardware. Um, so, uh, so Adam was able to work with a lot of our vendors to try to figure out how we could circumvent the supply chain issues that uh, have been going on with some of these uh, commercial vendors. Uh, we were able to get some hardware installed in the environment uh, here in January and February timeframe while we were working to kind of uh, work with our community uh, to kind of fine tune things in terms of the answers in the system. Uh, we set expectations. We let people know that, you know, the system can hallucinate. It's going to give you wrong answers. Um, but you also get wrong answers when you go out on Google and you try to get uh, an answer to a specific question, depending upon the website that you're searching on. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that we were bringing in UC San Diego context with the solution, um, you know, allowed us to be, uh, to be able to look at those documents that are surfaced for certain kinds of questions and then be able to boost and suppress those within the system to try to, you know, get it to have more and more accuracy over time. Um, so we did create, uh, you know, some facilitated sessions, which I'll kind of touch on in a bit. Um, but with that, uh, now that we have the hardware in place, uh, we are looking at rolling this to all employees uh, on both the uh, health sciences side uh, and the campus side, um, and not, you know, kind of excluding our patient care side, just because it's a different way of doing business and they have a lot of different data sources that we don't use necessarily on the campus and health sciences side uh, for the context. Um, and then, you know, look at uh, deploying that over the next several months. Um, so we would uh, target having uh, all employees enabled in the system uh, beginning at the end of May. So with that, uh, we did do a lot of these kind of facilitated user sessions. Um, and so as part of this, uh, we had a partnership with our operational strategic initiatives group. Um, they uh, worked with us to uh, engage our user community, um, you know, come up with uh, different ways in which we could get feedback. And we do have mechanisms to provide feedback directly in line within uh, the system itself. But, you know, just getting folks to talk about, you know, what's working, what's not working for them uh, in some of these ideation boards. And so they were really good at being able to, um, you know, kind of put this out in front of our end users and then uh, funneling this back to us. Um, and then us being able to kind of through prompt engineering and then other techniques, you know, within the dancer framework, uh, be able to fine tune things a bit further. So this is just a snapshot of one of those idea boards uh, that folks um, that we were able to pull together with OSI as part of this feedback. So we saw that people were using this for a multitude of different uh, different reasons, right? Um, you know, looking for campus services and amenities. Um, a lot of the use cases were around HR, professional development. Um, you know, career growth, those kinds of things. And so uh, it was interesting to see, you know, what people were using it for. Uh, and so, you know, we could then kind of fine tune things a little bit further. Um, you know, policies and procedures was a big one, right? And so, um, you know, with the multitude of policies that are out there at UCOP uh, and UC San Diego specific, um, you know, we saw a lot of policy related queries uh, in the environment, um, things related to contracts. And so, uh, IT related questions, uh, what group is supports, you know, X, Y, or Z platform. Um, those were things that uh, folks were, um, you know, asking of Triton GPT uh, and how to simply to log into a system. Uh, so uh, it was, it, it was kind of interesting and on the back end being able to see how people were interacting with it. Uh, and then again, kind of helping it to be more and more accurate over time. So with that, I'm gonna jump into a little demo. Um, I am going to uh, kind of log into Triton GPT here. This is our interface. We have a couple different assistants that are associated with it. Um, we have our UC San Diego assistant and the UC San Diego assistant uh, has all of the UCSD context behind it. Uh, we also have what we're calling a general AI assistant. Uh, so this general AI assistant does not have any UCSD context. Uh, what it does is it open up, opens up the context window, so it allows for more tokens. Um, so yeah, it basically is Llama 2 kind of straight out of the box. Uh, so you're able to interact with it from that means. Um, we do have uh, something else called a JD helper. Uh, and so similar, I think, to uh, you at UC Berkeley, 
uh, our chief human resources officer was getting a lot of questions about appropriate use uh, and how people were using uh, generative AI to develop things like job descriptions. So that was one of the early use cases that we kind of adopted was helping our hiring managers uh, being able to write job descriptions in an efficient way using generative AI. Um, so let me just jump into a quick demo on uh, Job Description Helper. So what we did was we fed uh, over 1,300 job descriptions, the career tracks, job cards into the system. Uh, and so basically it uses that as retrieval and allows the hiring manager to interact with it in kind of a natural language format to develop uh, a position overview for a job card. Um, and so for, as an example, let's say if I'm hiring a data systems analyst for the system now is going in and retrieving that uh, data systems analyst for job card. Uh, and now it's saying, please provide any and all relevant uh, details for the job. So I am just going to copy um, some information about how I'd want to customize this job for the specific role that we're hiring for. Um, so I'm saying part of the, the business intelligence and analytics team, uh, their responsibilities, uh, deep understanding of SQL and our data warehouse, uh, and they'll be working on SAP HANA. So uh, we've, saw, we've seen that hiring managers could just input a bunch of technical details, right? Uh, and so uh, this hopefully gives you kind of a good first uh, pass at creating a position overview. So if I just enter this into the system, what this is doing now is it's merging the text that I put in there with the actual template job card uh, that is in the career tracks uh, library. Um, so it's outputting um, you know, at least a good first cut uh, from some of the analysis that we've had with our HR community. Um, they've seen this as uh, you know, something quite a bit better than what they typically see from a hiring manager, at least as a first pass. Um, and so uh, you know, we're excited to continue to you know, help and fine tune this uh, and embed kind of more language in here um, you know, as, as we uh, continue to test and refine. So just to kind of show what it, exactly it's doing, you know, we do have these career tracks, job cards. This is the data systems analyst for. Um, we are basically passing this information in here with it. Uh, and it's using that, combining it again with the custom information that I put in there uh, to output this as a first cut for the position overview. Um, you, the UC San Diego assistant, uh, we we find that people are using this in a multitude of different ways. As I said, um, you know, we have got some starter prompts in here that people can use. So if I click in to say, you know, what is an IDC rate, um, and our cloud services exempt from IDC, you know, this information is on our intranet, uh, so it's being pulled in from. Um, source pages that is uh, pulled into the context, and then it's using that Llama 2 basically to provide the natural language on top of this. Um, so it's giving me some good summarization here of uh, what an IDC is or indirect cost rate. Um, and then it's providing the source documentation uh, that I can click on and then go to uh, to get the actual uh, you know, information that I need to use to validate the answer uh, provided by Triton GPT. Um, so we definitely encourage all the users, uh, and we do have training sessions that we've um, provided folks uh, that we really reinforce that you have to go to the source documents in order to get the right answer. We do have, uh, you know, in this footer here, asking folks to check all the sources and policies and laws. Um, you know, obviously we do see, you know, things hallucinating within the system, but we really do encourage that folks go and, and hit the source documents in order to validate anything that's being provided in the system. Um, there's, uh, you know, it can, it can do everything from uh, citing policies, procedures, uh, and answering, you know, specific questions around IDC. Um, it could also, if I'm hungry, I might ask it, um, you know, something like, what restaurants are open uh, right now that uh, serve sushi uh, for lunch? Um, so it goes and looks at some of the, the dining information that we have on our intranet. Uh, it'll pull back some specific restaurants uh, when they're open. Um, so it, it's good for kind of fun things as well. Uh, parking and transportation, um, you know, if I'm going to a building, I'll often ask it uh, where I might be able to park. Uh, and it provides that information with a link over to the map and the source documents. Um, so it's real convenient when it comes from that perspective. 
Um, it is mobile friendly too, uh, in responsive design. So uh, if you're doing it on your mobile phone, it's gonna look good uh, there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, some of the, the use cases that we have around it. Um, you know, faculty are also uh, engaged and are starting to use the system. Again, we're kind of keeping it to the administrative side as much as possible to begin with. We do have a faculty senate that's convened now um, that is looking at uh, kind of best practices and guidance for faculty uh, from a pedagogy perspective on how they could use generative AI. Uh, so we're waiting for that guidance really before we do anything broadly in kind of the teaching and learning space. Uh, there definitely has been some interest with faculty wanting to integrate uh, Canvas course information. Uh, also, you know, some of the, um, you know, some of the presentations and the collateral that they have, um, you know, in teaching the class that is stored in things like Google Drive and basically merging that together and creating kind of a teaching assistant uh, using this as kind of a back end. Um, so as we start to get some of the guidance coming out of the Academic Senate, uh, we'll be interested to see um, you know, what, be, what we can do to kind of support uh, the teaching and learning side with Triton GPT. Um, so again, this is, uh, you know, indexing our policies. It's going to pull back the policy information related to that. So we see a lot of faculty inquiries, um, you know, around, you know, what they're able to do or not do, you know, given the policies, um, you know, student conduct, those kinds of things. Those kind of answers are surfaced, obviously, easily through a system like this. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to look at the uh, Q&A and maybe care if you can help me maybe surface some questions that have come up that I'm happy to maybe answer and pause before I turn it back over to Adam. Sure. Thanks, Brett. We've got a number of questions in the Q&A. Um, some, some technical questions. Have you quantified a wrong slash correct answer ratio? I'm sorry, you kind of clicked out towards the end, a wrong slash correct answer ratio. A ratio? Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually an interesting question, Jack. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, I know you do a lot of analysis of the answers in the back. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, right now it, it's kind of difficult to say which which questions are real, which questions are tests. So uh, our initial groups of users, uh, we openly told them that, hey, you are testers. Uh, so if if we look at the logs of the interactions with the system, many of those interactions are just openly testing different versions of prompts, different uh, kind of approaches to asking the Triton GPT. So on, on average, I think uh, we are kind of 50-50, like thumbs up, thumbs down kind of ratio. But uh, uh, it's, like I said, it's probably not a real kind of usage test because uh, this, is, uh, this is a group that is basically helping us tune the system rather than just kind of run it in, in production at, the, at this time. Yeah, I guess just to jump in on that too, I mean, I think by and large, what you're going to see is people are going to thumbs down and provide the feedback because that's really what we've encouraged, right? So in general, I've talked to folks just anecdotally and they'll say, yeah, no, it gave me the right answers, but I really didn't give it a thumbs up because, you know, I, I just felt like, you know, I wanted to focus on improvement as opposed to just reinforcing what was already right. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, I think, um, you know, from our standpoint and some of the facilitated sessions we saw, I think it's kind of training people how to use generative AI to get the most out of it. So just being able to kind of format your prompts correctly um, to try to get the correct answers. So there's kind of a best practice around citing your goal, uh, citing the context, and then the action that you want the, uh, the large language model to perform. And so when we're in those sessions and facilitating that with end users, and they realize that they're getting much better results after that afterwards. And so part of uh, what we've done with the rollout is deploy some generative AI training, some prompt engineering training that is facilitated by our OSI group. So we'll continue to do that in like an office hours format. Uh, and we have some webinars that we've recorded uh, and making available to the community. Uh, and it's also available via UC Learning. Uh, they've also, and I believe Bill too, they made those available so that it kind of strips out the Triton GPT specific things. Uh, and so uh, now other universities are taking advantage of that as well. There's a question here about the on the hardware side. How did you plan for scaling this or limiting slash throttling slash prioritizing use of it so that your on-premises configuration isn't overtaxed? What monitoring do you have in place around this? Adam, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that. So I'll start with the monitoring first. Um, we've, uh, we have analytics coming out of both the uh, large language model and all of the application components. And those are flowing into uh, several different 
analysis tools so we can look at uh, activity in, from different perspectives. Um, for regarding uh, hardware scaling, I think probably the language model is would probably be the weak point. And so what we've done there is we've done extensive modeling of the the uh, hard the uh, essentially the number of parallel users that uh, a given uh, quantity of hardware can support. Uh, and that was informed through some of our earliest testers that came in in uh, November and December. We were able to get a little bit more insight into typical user behavior. How uh, how many seconds delay did they typically leave between chat prompts and follow ups and the things like that? Those are really uh, those are the factors that drive the ultimate load on the most expensive part of the hardware, which it, which are the GPUs. And that's really what we focused on was uh, making sure we had the GPU capacity. Um, the other aspects of the system, uh, storage, uh, CPU, networking, uh, those are all pretty familiar territory for us, and we have enough uh, ex uh, excess capacity elsewhere to pull in uh, as needed uh, if we run into any problems. Thank you, Adam. Question here, how frequently is your AI reading the internal web pages or documents to make sure it's giving the most up-to-date answers? And a related question is, you know, how much additional training do you, do you do on top of the LAMA 2 model so that Triton GPT can be aware of the UCSD context? And how is that training done? So, you know, the alignment with the content and the frequency and as well, how is how is the training done? So it's, it's updated. Um... Nightly, for the most part, I believe the agents run every night. Is that right, Chuck, Adam? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the agents run nightly. It'll pull up the updated information into the system, into the vector database. And so um, so it, it updates on a pretty frequent basis for all the, the websites that are pulled in as part of the context. Um, and then, sorry, what was the other part of that? Yeah, the second question was, you know, how much additional training do you do on top of the LAMA2 model so that Triton GPT can be aware of the UCSD context? And how is this training done? So there is some inherent things that the Dancer framework gives us in terms of being able to boost or suppress content within the environment. I would say uh, that obviously helps. Um, the other part of it is, is prompt engineering and prompt tuning. Jack, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh... Essentially, well, training can can mean several things in a generative AI uh, context, right? So we are focusing on on RAG architecture, which we will have in in, in the next slides, uh, which which is basically that uh, we are creating a vector space of embeddings uh, in in in, uh, in our Vespa, you know, database, uh, and that is the basically the knowledge base for the AI, right? So once once this is in place, then training can 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 have a couple of different uh, kind of facets to it, right? One one is that you can prioritize certain vectors in, in Vespa, right? Uh, and the second thing is that you can uh, change your system prompts to uh, actually uh, kind of refocus the AI on, on certain features in, in text. Like we spend a lot of time, for example, on refocusing uh, uh, the large language model to to pro properly uh, cite resources, right? So to have uh, really solid references whenever possible, right? So so these kind of things we are doing right now. If the question is about fine tuning, we are not fine tuning models yet, but I think that's also something that that could be on the table for the future. That's great, thank you. Just to make sure that you both have enough time to present, maybe we can move on to to Adam or um, Jack as well. And we can continue to answer the questions in the Q&A um, during the uh, presentations and after. Sounds good, keep the questions coming. All right, everyone. So um, as Jack was alluding to, um, the uh, Triton GPT is based on what's called a retrieval augmented generation model, uh, probably uh, has been discussed quite a lot uh, within your community. Um, and so uh, the uh, it that model depends on an external source of curated content. And that's where I'm gonna start here. Uh, we are right now pulling in public UCSD uh, data for the most part um, and uh, crawling the web much as Google or other uh, search services would do. But the, uh, the list of targets and the rankings and the weighting uh, those are set by uh, business process. Oh, sorry, business owners, uh, content owners uh, here within the university, and that's really how we can point the output of this uh, system, or rather, uh, ensure that the output of this system uh, is accurate 
and consistent with the UCSD policy. There are some areas I saw a note in the chat uh, uh, regarding uh, tapioca uh, express uh, not actually serving sushi as uh, Brett had found. Uh, there are some areas that we have not yet uh, covered with that uh, content curation. And in those cases, you will see uh, hallucination. And so uh, one of our efforts is to work with the business com uh, community to work with, uh, uh, with, with the content experts uh, to ensure that uh, any areas that are important to uh, UCSD operation uh, can be uh, curated properly. Um, so in the, in the uh, retrie retrieval augmentation generation uh, uh, model, the documents are loaded, as uh, Jack mentioned uh, earlier, into a vector database uh, where the entire co the contents of a paragraph or perhaps the whole document are converted into a uh, very wide numeric vector. And that those vectors, all of all of the vectors in the database uh, uh, corresponding to all of our content, are uh, compared with the user's prompt. And from that, a set of uh, candidate documents is obtained. And those will be fragments, like I said, of uh, individual documents. It could be, uh, in some cases, tabular data, PDFs, et cetera. Uh, the uh, application framework that we're using, uh, Dancer, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, has built-in translation uh, capabilities uh, for various types of content. Uh, once the uh, user's prompt, where can I get sushi, and the uh, relevant information uh, it are, are compiled. Uh, that information uh, or that collection of information is then passed along to our large language model. Uh, and that goes by way of an API gateway. Uh, we are uh, looking to a future where we may have other uh, batch processes or other applications that may want to use, make use of our inference infrastructure. For now, and probably for the next uh, several months, uh, we are looking at Triton GPT as being the only user of our VLLM until we uh, get a better handle on uh, its overall uh, capacity and capability. Um, let's see. In addition to the public web content, uh, we are uh, looking to pull in data from our various uh, campus data warehouses. Uh, uh, such as uh, facilities, research, uh, employee data, and the like. Um, and uh, that's going to be uh, handled through an integration with Wolfram Alpha. And uh, so we will utilize the uh, uh, planning capabilities of Alpha to generate queries against uh, those uh, data stores to bring ad additional facts that will then again supplement the user's prompt. And then we'll rely on the language model to uh, perform the final uh, natural language analysis. Um, pulling in data uh, from uh, institutional uh, uh, data stores uh, will uh, raise privacy and security question, uh, uh, concerns. Um, we, we would be dealing with P3, potentially some types of P4 data. And it's for that that we are uh, working with, or it is to address that concern that we are working with uh, some faculty members here on campus who have launched a commercial product uh, that uh, encrypts, performs a one-way encryption uh, and uh, perturbation on those documents that are being passed into the large language model so that they are still uh, equivalent in terms of the uh, language model's understanding of the data but to the outside uh, viewer, uh, they are gibberish. And uh, the, uh, the process uh, that they have built out uh, ensures uh, a relatively strong level of security for that data. For the, then that's the data going into the model. The answers coming out of the model, uh, those would still uh, potentially uh, contain private information. And that's, a, that's an open question we're dealing with uh, right now, how to, uh, how to protect that as well. Um, and then finally, uh, there was mention of fine tuning. I'll cover that in the uh, next slide. Yeah. So we are using the VLLM inference engine 
Uh, so this is the code that takes the user's prompt and runs it through token by token uh, through all the layers and the billions of parameters of our language model. Uh, we are using uh, Llama 2 right now. Uh, we made a decision early on uh, to stick with Llama 2, even though several others uh, have come out in the meantime. We wanted to get um, Triton GPT out and released uh, on a stable platform, but we've uh, architected the system so that it will be easy for us to run additional models like Mixtral or fine-tuned versions of Llama or even Llama 3, if and when that comes out um, in addition. And uh, we'll be able to pivot uh, the, um, uh, the data flow uh, into those models um, as needed. Um, we went with the VLLM uh, inference engine over a number of others that we evaluated. That includes NVIDIA's Triton inference server. Uh, there's a uh, tool called llama.cpp, which is very popular for people running models on their desktops. Uh, FastChat and several others. Um, we found VLLM's uh, attention to speed uh, and scalability compelling. Um, it comes out of uh, Berkeley's uh, LM Sys group and the uh, Sky Research Lab. Uh, uh, those are groups that have been uh, really uh, spearheading the intersection of uh, distributed system design and uh, machine learning uh, operations. And so uh, they built a system uh, which is uh, highly parallelizable, supports um, thousands of uh, parallel streams of inference uh, at, uh, at the higher end, um, but, but does so in a very memory efficient uh, fashion, uh, preserving the resources on those GPU cards uh, and uh, consolidating uh, different prompts or different uh, query streams uh, to conserve those, uh, that memory. Um, it also uh, provides uh, performance metrics. I mentioned those earlier. Uh, those have been very useful to understand the, uh, the impact of uh, these uh, large prompts, especially prompts uh, that are supplemented with uh, uh, additional documents, and to understand how, uh, uh, how many users we will be able to support. Right now, we're running the system on uh, four H100. GPU cards. Uh, we have uh, a couple uh, additional sets of those cards available should we need them, but we're fairly confident that those uh, four uh, GPUs will uh, carry us through the first several months of release to the campus. Uh, the performance, the VLLM has been uh, 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 exceptional at uh, combining uh, all of the, the, the parallel uh, input streams. And let's see, the other, I guess the final uh, aspect of VLLM that uh, uh, we're very happy with is the pace of rapid innovation. As new techniques have come, uh, 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 come to light within uh, the academic world, and so this would be things like uh, uh, hosting multiple fine-tuned uh, copies of a single model uh, at the same time in parallel without having to actually dedicate the resources to each one of those models. Uh, we can efficiently serve them all at one time. Um, uh, prompt caching uh, is another uh, efficiency improvement uh, that has come in recently. And that allows the uh, VLLM engine uh, to store and, uh, and retrieve uh, previous prompts that have come in. And so if we have multiple people consulting the same uh, set of documents or the same question, uh, we can be even more, that, even more efficient. And then finally, uh, they are uh, rapidly uh, taking on new hardware architectures, which brings us beyond NVIDIA and their GPUs, uh, and potentially allows us to expand out into cloud offerings uh, uh, should we just uh, find the need to, uh, uh, to grow beyond our, our local capabilities. So uh, Dancer is the, uh, uh, is the framework that we are using for that retrieval augmented generation. Uh, it was uh, built by a couple of UC San Diego graduates uh, and uh, it, it is uh, purpose built to, uh, to perform enterprise uh, retrieval augmented uh, uh, generation retrieval. Um, and uh, as Brett showed, uh, it features a number of connectors. Uh, we've filled in, uh, or we have uh, made use of several existing connectors. 
uh, but we are also uh, have been building uh, custom connectors. And so we found that flexibility that they created uh, very helpful in adapting this generic tool to our uh, local context. So it's another example of uh, Dancer's retrieval flow. Uh, when uh, Dancer uh, first consults that vector database to determine uh, or to identify uh, relevant uh, articles or uh, data, data pieces, um, it will first run uh, those through the LLM behind the scenes to identify and rank uh, those uh, uh, that content. So that only the most relevant content, uh, according to both the embedding model and the large language model, are ultimately passed to the LLM to answer the user's query. All right, and then next I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Jack, who's gonna talk about uh, some of the other uh, tools beyond Dancer that we've been looking at. Yes, uh, thank you, Adam. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, behind the scenes, uh, there's, there's a number of interesting things that are going on. That uh, that will that will continue developing and uh, extend the capabilities. I've seen a few questions about what's next, whether it's going to be maybe multimedia content in play or or, or um, you know kind of um, next generations of, of capabilities, right? So uh, so I think the answer is is yes. So obviously we will continue expanding. Uh, because uh, Dancer uh, as, as a platform is based on very commonly used libraries like uh, Langchain, Langchain uh, and uh, Lama Index. And there's some capabilities that we are uh, not tapping into, uh, you know, very heavily uh, and, and we can. So obviously tool selection uh, that you can see here is something that is on the table. And um, we have a few slides down uh, down the road here where we will be uh, kind of showing the, the, the plans, but essentially, right, we, we don't have to call only one thing, right? So to, to provide, provide an answer, uh, we don't have to only interact with, with Vespa, our uh, vector database. Uh, we can kind of look for search engines and maybe go to Google Scholar or maybe go to other resources uh, that, that exist within the university to, to kind of get answers. So for example, there, there are other AI systems currently in place that, that are answering very specific questions. And perhaps uh, Triton GPT should be uh, redirecting uh, the, the prompts to, to that to that location. Also, uh, one more thing that maybe was not obvious from from our presentation uh, is that uh, there is a secondary flow uh, within Dancer that is uh, verifying the quality of an answer. So there was a few questions about, hey, you know, maybe you know, sushi is not there, or maybe how do you know that your answer is correct? So obviously, um, there is uh, th those are big questions. Um, and uh, one thing that is happening behind the scenes is that uh, we have. Uh, we have a system prompt mechanism that is asking the LLM whether the answer provided based on the retrieved uh, vectors from Vespa and the large language model processing of, of those answers is actually relevant to uh, to the original prompt that, that, that has certain semantics and that has cer certain meaning. And if that uh, answer is kind of drifting maybe a, a, away semantically, then uh, uh, our uh, setup is, is uh, internal setup is basically going to say that you know uh, I the, the large language model is going to respond oh I don't have uh, very accurate information on that uh, on that subject matter however you know here is what I've got right so there is there is some mitigation of, of problems that are kind of along the lines of of the of the agents uh, capabilities that, that we have um uh, next uh, slide please Yes, uh, another uh, capability that is going into the direction of, of you know available libraries and and what what can we do kind of on the back end is that uh, there are certain things that we can expose to users as as GUI based uh, uh, kind of um, models of, of interaction. So what you are here, what you are looking here at, is a graphical interface called uh, Langflow. Uh, uh, it's a it's a graphical interface to to Langchain, so this is a uh, very uh, interesting proposition because it basically allows you to create uh, something maybe like a digital twin of your uh, main system, 
So here, just with, with dragging and dropping things, you can create a reasonably uh, sizable um, vector space, uh, vector database that, that is going to be your uh, RAG, you know, uh, resource. Uh, it's, uh, you can also create your custom prompt structure um, that you can use for testing. And uh, something that I've been using quite a bit uh, is also, uh, you know, as, a, as an analytics tool on the, on the log uh, files that we are generating. So I can have a, a generative workflow within Langflow that, that we are looking at to actually uh, analyze, uh, you know, various uh, aspects of what what is going on in logs, how people are interacting with the system. So as an analytics tool or as a kind of prototyping tool, this is a very rapid development kind of a deal, which uh, which is uh, which could be desktop based, right? So I I can hook it up to our main Llama, uh, you know, uh, environment. Or I can hook it up to something like a very small um, Mistral desktop, you know, model like you know uh, uh, Mistral Eight or, or something similar, and then uh, just kind of run the prompts, you know, on on the reasonably you know fast you know uh, laptop. So uh, so that's that's kind of an interesting capability here. Um, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, so um, so okay, so that's kind of like what what is next, right? So uh, so the next thing is that uh, well, what if we would like to take a look uh, at other sources of information and generally speaking, uh, maybe structured data data sources. So what if we would like to take a look at uh, the activity hub tables and uh, use uh, those. Uh, uh, resources uh, to answer questions. So this will be our um, next step where um, we will be using the, the Wolfram framework uh, to help us uh, interact with databases through a, basically a conversation with an SQL generation pipeline. So um, uh, the, the workflow that, that we are looking at here is that uh, a question that uh, will contain uh, semantics that is pointing to maybe a, a student activity hub, maybe about uh, something related to uh, uh, degree programs, like how many students are in the cohort that are taking, you know, introduction to math or something of that nature. That's clearly something that needs to be answered with, with a database um, uh, data sets. So, um, so this conversational system will generate uh, SQL uh, statements. Those SQL statements will be executed against the, the HANA, uh, you know, uh, column groups, and then uh, the result is going to be compiled uh, by large large language model, and either either provided uh, in a textual format or provided in a graphical uh, kind of environment where this uh, this kind of pipeline basically creates a conversational uh, BI tool uh, with uh, with uh, with SQL access to to our uh, data databases. So there's several steps that that need to happen for this thing to to be operational. And again, you know, one of the things that uh, that we are working uh, with with our generative pipelines is that we need to create a very solid uh, metadata for our activity hub uh, column groups. So that the uh, the large language model is uh, aware of the of the information uh, semantics that 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 we have in our databases. So uh, it's kind of a huge discussion here, per perhaps a topic for another webinar. But anyway, this is an exciting uh, capability here. Um, next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So uh, so this is kind of what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, in in a little bit of um, maybe a technical detail where uh, the uh, the vector space on the left hand side you know the, the metadata is actually residing in our uh, vespa um, vector store so um, in, in this in, in, if that's the case right the, this is the an exciting capability because we can use the the retrieval portion of, of our dancer flow uh, which is a uh, uh, utilizing uh, an, an E5 large uh, embedding model size, so it's a it's basically a 1024 dimensional vector that um, that is that is searchable through a uh, basically a BM25 retrieval model that is uh, assessing the similarity between the uh, 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 between the user prompt and the and the vector space. Uh, representations. So if that's if that's the case, then uh, the uh, the SQL generation process is going to be informed by by an extensive uh, metadata that we are generating uh, uh, with generative AI uh, 
procedure is kind of a separate thing. And uh, so the SQL statement is is going to be aware of, of the semantics of our databases, right? And that if that's the case, then the, uh, then we already confirmed that uh, the uh, the SQL quality, uh, the SQL uh, you know generation uh, generative qualities uh, of the system is very high. So uh, so the battle uh, that that we need to win is basically on the metadata side. Uh, we need to represent our uh, databases very well in in, in that respect. Um, next, uh, please. Yeah, so so while we are watching here on the left hand side, you know, there was just basically a natural language question that 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 can be asked you to to formulate SQL. Now, uh, so here is here is an example how this might be further extended, uh, because uh, the Wolfram. Uh, 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 the Wolfram environment also has uh, a tremendous, tremendous resources in them. So there is, uh, so there is something uh, that is very attractive, uh, which is a curated knowledge base of, of facts, and those facts are, uh, you know, very important for maybe educational applications that we certainly will have. Um, there is also census data. So for our fund management applications on the administrative administrative side. If there's like let's say a question, how do we, you know, how do we predict enrollment, right? Uh, what's the zip code analytics that we would like to do to assess, you know, the maybe the the enrollment level for the next year? That information is going to be sitting there, so we don't have to reach, uh, we don't have to look into, you know, uh, enrichment data sets like Personix or Melissa or something like that, where you know there's basically a third-party census data. This stuff is going to be within the. The private cloud within our uh, uh, without our resources, computational resources. Another thing that is uh, very attractive is that Wolfram also uh, has, as you probably know, uh, Wolfram language. Uh, you know, which is a very capable tool to maybe build predictive analytics and visualizations and and things like that. So, so on the left hand side, the, that flow that you see here on the on the left hand side doesn't have to end at uh, generating an SQL statement and you know maybe you know I don't know maybe creating a Py python code based on that or, or 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 some sort of a visualization it can it can be a confluence of of several things that that we we get from wolfram so um so that the answer is is could be predictive in nat nature could be interactive uh, graphically and uh, could could be enhanced uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, kind of the, the the fact retrieval, right? So, if you know, um, application to calculus, for example, or to physics or to chemistry are kind of right in the box. So I can right away ask questions about chemistry problems or 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 algebra or or calculus or or whatever we wish. Uh, there is also optimization libraries within Wolfram, right? So uh, again, on the uh, administrative side, uh, allocating resources and optimizing them through some sort of linear programming. Uh, approaches is uh, again conversationally enabled within that uh, environment. Um, next, please. Yeah, so th there's so here are some domains that that we we can look at, uh, uh, you know, right away and, and uh, out of the box, right? So so there's uh, as you can see. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, in addition to to those to those areas here, there is already personas that are generated that that can be uh, you know like a teaching persona or uh, maybe a tester persona or you know there is also personas like talk to me as if you are a king or something like that. So um, so this is a tremendously uh, interesting uh, environment where you know currently. Uh, you know, the personas that we are developing, uh, let's say for Triton GPT, the, the main system, and then for JD Helper can be enhanced by personas that will be a chemistry teacher or a physics teacher, right? Or a fund manager that is focusing on optimizing things, right? So on the on the educational side and also on the uh, on the administrative side, there's there's uh, capabilities here uh, that that kind of come into play because there is uh, there is a generative access to Wolfram language that can pull all those things for us uh, uh, in a kind of uh, notebook fashion or or however we would like to shape the interaction. Uh, next, please. 
Yeah, so again, a, an example here, right? Uh, yeah, write an essay comparing, uh, you know, two stars uh, is, is is kind of an interesting thing because we know that the system is not going to hallucinate. It's going to reach into uh, its own rag architecture and uh, kind of retrieve uh, facts that have been uh, scientifically confirmed, uh, uh, you know, within the Wolfram environment, right? So you no longer uh, are kind of relying on the on the neural network's uh, knowledge. Uh, you are primarily relying on the uh, on the knowledge base that is available there so so we can see that the capabilities here this is just a simple example where we are pulling the the underlying facts and using the large language model to, to kind of generate you know maybe an essay or maybe a poem or or, or something that that is going to be interesting uh, for sure for for several uh, use cases um next please Yes, so there was also a few questions uh, uh, about uh, uh, how do we kind of deal with uh, evaluating the system and kind of controlling what's going on. So, um, you know, Caliper is, is one of the ways to, to have like a deep, you know, high granularity uh, access to, to what's going on and uh, probably, you know, ha having those insights into user cognitive uh, efforts it's kind of an interesting thing to to see, you know, uh, and and will be a platform for for us improving the the UI and and kind of tuning the system so that it's responding to user needs. So, so I know that we don't have much time, but I, I think that uh, you know maybe we can answer some questions now. I know Adam and I, as as Jack was talking, and I know what Jack was doing the same when Adam was talking to try to answer as many questions as possible. Given that we only have a minute, I think just summarizing maybe some of the questions just were along the lines of, you know, hallucinations and, and accuracy and things like that. Uh, we know this thing is not going to be perfect. And I think that was kind of our main message to the cabinet when we were looking at deploying this was that, um, you know, this is being braced uh, by leadership at UC San Diego. It's never going to be 100 percent accurate. Large language models are prone to hallucinations. Uh, but we're going to be doing our best to make sure that we're you know steering it in the right direction, given all the techniques that we kind of just discussed. So yeah, I mean, the kind of cost benefit of not deploying something like this broadly, um, our leadership has said, uh, get it in the hands of people, getting them uh, used to using it, teach them how to use generative AI. Uh, they also definitely see this as, as kind of a teaching moment in terms of how to get the most out of it. Um, and you know, as we maybe hit bumps in the road with maybe people signing some things that we didn't predict for, um, that will uh, you know, kind of focus efforts in, in that direction. Um, but in terms of not doing anything versus doing something and just making sure it gets better over time, our leadership is is leaning to the latter. Thank you so much, Brett, Adam, and Jack, for a very interesting discussion and um, for answering questions from our community. It's always so interesting for us to hear what's going on across the UC system, how UC system um, universities can differ so much um, between locations and also learn from each other and share knowledge. And we really appreciate all of our membership for coming today. And we will record the presentation, send out a, a transcript of the chat with all the great answers that Brett, Adam, and Jack have provided. And um, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Brett. Thank, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.